I, I'm going to talk about uh, economic and financial crises. Um, and let me set some context first. Um, we had a number of workshops uh, during the in most intense initial periods of the crisis over COVID uh, with developing country governments who were wanting to understand what actions were being taken in countries of the global north that were incompatible with their international trade and investment obligations. And the WTO website actually has, under the GATT on trade and goods and the GATTs on trade and services, uh, a catalogue of notifications from countries about measures that have been adopted. And uh, South governments were especially interested because they wanted to say, well, if they can do it, we can do it too. Uh, which is not always the way asymmetry works. but um, and, and so there were a variety of measures, some of which we've seen here, such as new vetting uh, criteria and thresholds for foreign direct investment, uh, preferences being given for subsidies and bailouts and so on to local companies uh, or to those in joint ventures, uh, con forced converting of facilities, such as health facilities, um, or, or closure of ports, um, uh, measures affecting the, the supply of, of, um, of port services, uh, and of course restrictions on labour mobility, uh, all of which uh, were problematic in terms of the rules and which then raised questions about how far the exceptions uh, would provide for protection. So we had quite a lot of discussions uh, with South governments on that, but what I've become more interested in working on uh, with some others um, is what the, the downstream economic, fiscal and financial crises are going to be arising out from COVID-19. And uh, in particular, when because I mainly work with countries in the global south, um, we're seeing firstly a revenue crisis. So you've got... Um, huge demands on government spending, you've got really serious problems about domestic revenue, uh, you've got mounting debt, um, and looking for innovative new forms of taxation, uh, such as digital taxes. The second is um, a, a quite serious sovereign debt crisis that's now emerging. We've seen Zambia as being the first uh, of those whose debt clearly related um, uh, to COVID, uh, but more predictions of debt default and sovereign debt restructuring, and what are the issues for that, including in the investment agreements. And the third, uh, which is a, a mixture of a foreign exchange and financial stability crisis, um, which includes the need to be able to impose capital controls, um, capital inflows, capital outflows, um, holding mechanisms to stop uh, rapid inflows and outflows. Um, and we have actually been here before because we had exactly these same discussions after the global financial crisis uh, when we were looking at what the impediments are in the trade and investment agreements to the adoption of uh, various kinds of measures. And uh, I, I want to just refer a little bit to that because my last Marsden project was uh, in looking at transcending embedded neoliberalism in post-neoliberal era, and post-neoliberal era was partly around the instabilities of systemic crises. Uh, one of my case studies was on the question of financial regulation and capital controls. And, and one of the problems was that as, almost as soon as the crisis was over, even though the IMF had rehabilitated the notion of capital controls that it had previously issued. Um, once the pressure was off, then effectively um, the status quo regrouped and um, nothing really changed. Including uh, attempts to have significant discussions um, 
in the Committee on Trade and Financial Services uh, in, in the WTO. There were a number of developing countries who said we need to revisit the rules that the US got at, in the mid-1990s on financial services uh, and we need to be able to look in both the WTO and in the free trade agreements on what kind of flexibilities there are for that. And even the EU did start to deal with some of that, um, but has backed off again. So we, we went to the crisis period, and then we had the regroup. Likewise with investment disputes. Uh, when we had, in particular, the sovereign debt crises and the sovereign debt restructuring, and then we had the vulture funds coming in and buying up the distressed debt, and refusing to participate in the collective restructuring and then demanding that countries pay the full face value uh, of that debt. Yeah. Which triggered, was one of the things that triggered the crisis that we had in the, um, in the ISDS, the Investor State Dispute Settlement uh, process. Um, and then as part of that crisis, and Penny's going to, I think, talk a little uh, about that we had various reforms, we had the UNCITRAL Working Group 3 reforms and the ICSID reforms, and all of which have managed down to micro level changes. Um, just, been, I've been quite involved in that. So, again, the rear guard actions uh, after the global financial crisis meant that nothing really changed. And so we've seen very recently that Jeffrey Sachs and James Bacchus and others have called for a moratorium on COVID-related uh, ISDS disputes. Um, but neither investors nor their host states are uh, working with that. The IMF, again, has come out recently and said capital controls are going to be a necessary part of the toolkit to deal with the crisis that developing countries especially are facing in the COVID context because there's been these incredibly sharp reversals uh, of inflows and outflows uh, to countries um, which are hugely vulnerable and, and three of the IMF um, researchers who've been dissidents on this, IMF and dissidents, um, you know, say that, that what we've seen in COVID is that Capital flows to emerging markets are both fickle and they disappear when they're needed most. Yeah? And, and so something has to happen around it. And the IMF's institutional view has actually, in, in the report from these three IMF researchers now, been explicitly linked to the problems of a number of trade and investment agreements that undermine the ability of countries to use capital controls. The last of the examples is the problem of taxation. And what we're seeing now is governments trying to find novel ways to tax, in particular to tax those multinationals who have profited most out of COVID-19, which is the big tech companies. And that's not new. There's been a project in the OECD, the BEPS project, that's been looking at how to tax companies that don't have a presence in your country. Um, but we have in the e-commerce rules uh, now uh, rules saying you cannot require a local presence, you cannot require a particular legal form of a local presence, you can't control the data and so on. And, and also that you can't cap royalty payments that are part of the profit shifting where it's a condition of foreign investment and the like. And so we're seeing this tension, this huge tension between what are the tools that countries are going to need to address what will be a prolonged economic and financial crisis and the constraints that we have in the agreements. So a few of us have been talking about what to do about this. We think it will be about March to June next year before we start to have the measures being adopted in countries. Uh, when then we're going to see what kind of pressure will come on. Will it come from other states? Will it come from investors? Will, it, will the IMF do another flip on conditionalities of debt financing? So what, what are we going to have happening here? And, and our concern is that the regrouping is already happening and that COVID-19 might just be another crisis 
that hasn't brought about the transformation that's needed.